Good day and welcome to the online service of Sunwood Park Baptist Church on the 25th of October 2020. And today we'll be looking at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24 and 25, just the two verses. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24 to 25. And just last week we looked at the fruits of the Spirit and just before that in the same sermon we looked at the the works of the flesh and and we saw how Paul tells us that we should be led by the spirit so that we will cease from doing the works of the flesh and that we would rather do the works or the fruit of the spirit and it's interesting that this is the fruit of the spirit by implication it is the the fruit that he works in us Every true believer must have every single one of these fruit, parts of the fruit, but it doesn't mean that they are perfect. In fact, some of them might be very, they might be very little to be noticed. And, and in some of the areas, we might be much better, do, doing much better. But all of these things has to be then to some point, And we should always be those who are growing so that this fruit will be more clearly visible in our lives. But then we come this morning to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24 and 25, the continuation of his argument, but he brings in something slightly different. In verse 24 he says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. As for the reading of God's word, let's pray and ask God to help us to understand and also to apply whatever this passage wants to teach us. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for this day and this time that we can have together. And we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together and that we can study your word, that you have given us brains. But more than that, you've just given us brains, Father, because we know that even people with great brains sometimes struggle to understand the depths of Scripture. But we thank you that you've given us more than just brains. You have given us the Holy Spirit, which enables us to comprehend the truth of your word, that he reveals what you are teaching to us through your word. And so we pray now, as we come to your word, that we will have that um, enlightenment by the Holy Spirit, that he will show us what the truth of your word is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Olympic Games um, actually originated about 3,000 years ago in Greece. And it was about 700 BC, around about the same time as Israel was taken into exile by the Assyrians. And it's interesting that in those original years, they ran without any clothes on. So they ran naked, in other words. And so for an athlete to win, he didn't just have to practice hard and and run as well as he could. He also had to cast off all the things that would hinder him in his running, including his clothes, in fact. And perhaps this brings new light to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse and verse 1, when it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And actually, in actual fact, this verse asks two questions of us. It asks firstly of us that we should cast off all the things that may hinder our spiritual race. And secondly, then, that we should run with absolute endurance in the spiritual race. So that's the second thing it asks of us. And, and actually, these two questions are the exact same questions as the questions for our passage today that we should cast off the works of the flesh and that we should also keep in step or walk by the Spirit. Now, last week we saw what these works of the flesh and what the works of the Spirit was. And and we saw that that the Bible showed us this is the way in which we should live and it also showed us this is the way that we should not live. It showed us that Christians are those who die to sin and who strive towards holiness. 
And maybe in this week that has passed, if you listened to last week's sermon, you, you took an honest look at your life and and perhaps you looked and you saw, well, I see the fruit of the Spirit, it's there, but it isn't as clearly visible as it should be. It's not, it's there, but it's not all there. Which means that there's still work in you, which means that you are just like every other believer, because none of us are perfect. We are all on our way to holy, perfect holiness, which we will never, of course, arrive at, at this, in this side of, of, of the grave. You see, the Christian isn't what he should be, but the Christian is also not what he used to be. We are working towards becoming more holy. We are continually fighting against the old man. We are killing sin. But how do we do that? How, how can we get this right? How can we become what we should be? How can we cast off this burden of fleshly life? And how can we strive towards living through the Spirit? How is it possible for us to live in this freedom to which Christ has set us free? And that's what I want to talk to you about today, about Christian victory. And our thesis then for today is conquer the flesh by walking by the Spirit. Conquer the flesh by walking by the Spirit. And to do that, we will consider the two instructions that this passage gives us this morning. Firstly, the first instruction it gives us is to crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh. We find that in verse 24. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. So, crucifixion was the way in which, in ancient times, only the most serious criminals were executed. It was actually a very inhumane way for people to die. And so it's important that we understand that the instruction that is given to us here is that we should crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. So we cannot go about killing sin in a passive way. We have to launch an active attack against sin. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. He says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And so the request is to take our flesh with its passions and desires, and to take it to the place of execution and to nail it to the cross. That's what it means to repent from your sins. That's what it means for you to die of your old self. And that can't be done half-heartedly. We can't, cannot be passive about these things. We have to declare a war against our sins. And what does it mean to fight against sin? Well, how do we do what we are asked to do? Well, I think what helps us is to understand something of crucifixion. If we understand three aspects from, of crucifixion, perhaps it will help us to understand what is required of us. Firstly, I want us to understand the first aspect of crucifixion is that it is merciless. It was a horrible death. In fact, Jesus was crucified to humiliate him and to humiliate those who followed him. And so we must act mercilessly to, against sin. We should treat sin as if it's a great criminal, because it is, that it's a murderer, isn't it? We have to remember what sin wants to do to us. Sin is not leading us to heaven, it's leading us to hell. Sin has no good intentions with us. It desires, its desires to destroy us. And so we better destroy sin before it destroys us. We must be merciless in our fight against thirst. We must be bloodthirsty to eradicate it. There should be no other option to us but to completely destroy that enemy that lives within us, who wants to take us to the eternal hell. Secondly, Crucifixion is painful. I think we need to prepare ourselves for the reality that the fight against sin will not be easy. It will be painful. Crucifixion is big nails being driven through your hands and your feet. 
a person who is crucified, the, the blood starts pushing up in their body from their feet upwards, it starts pushing up in their body until it comes to the lungs, and then it starts pushing over the lungs so that the, the, the mere fact of breathing becomes absolutely impossible, it becomes extremely painful until the point where it's just not possible anymore. And so we must understand that if we want to die to the flesh, it's going to be painful. The Lord Jesus says to us that if your eye causes you to stumble, you should cut it out. If your hand is the thing that makes you do what is wrong, then you should cut it off. And so we cannot act gently against sin. We have to apply pain. We have to understand that this is going to be painful to us. Killing off sin requires serious and painful action. I mean, it's no coincidence, I think, that Paul calls it the passions and the desires of the flesh. This is the things that we want to do. These are the things that we desire. These are the things that we like, but we need to destroy them. In fact, if I, if I could give a comparison, perhaps, it is like standing at the bedside of a loved one and having to make the decision to switch off the machine of life support, which will take away their life. This is something that we like to do. This is what we used to be into. But now we have to switch it off. We have to kill it so that we can live in this new life. It's not easy. It comes with great pain. But we cannot continue in this way. It is painful. But then thirdly, crucifixion is decisive. And what I mean by that is that if somebody is sent to be crucified... They have to die. They didn't hang somebody on the cross simply just to take him off later. No, they made sure that that person died. And, and to help with that, they even placed a guard right there by the, by the crucifix to watch this person and to make sure that he eventually dies. And, and just to, for us to understand, this, in some cases, it actually took a very long time, up to four days for a person to die. But they had to die. There was no other option. They were put on the cross so that they would die. We have to put our sin on the cross so that, they, so that we will kill it, so that it will eventually be destroyed. John Brown explains what is required. He says, crucifixion produced death not suddenly, but gradually. And the true Christian do not succeed in completely destroying sin, we don't do completely destroy, succeed in destroying the flesh while we are here below on earth. But they have to fix the flesh on the cross. And they have to be determined to keep it there until it is expired. You see, boys, brothers and sisters, we can't have a, a soft-handed approach to sin. We have to fight and fight. We cannot take a break. We have to keep fighting because that's what's asked of those who belong to Christ. We have to fight against sin from the moment of our conversion. That's when it starts. That's when the fight starts, isn't it? At that day, I'm sure you remember it, you declared that you hated your sin. That you didn't want to do these things anymore. But that's only where it started. That's not where it ends. We have to fight against the sin every single day until our dying day. We have to keep fighting against sin. And so, the point that is being made here is that sin is on the cross. But we must ensure that it stays there until it dies. It must be destroyed. Just like crucifixion is merciless and painful and decisive, that should be our approach to sin as well. It requires us to nail it to the cross and to leave it there. It requires us to fight against sin every single day until it is dead. Because remember what the Lord Jesus said is that if we want to follow him, we must take up our cross daily and follow him. Brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to be slack for even a moment. Because the moment that we give opportunity to sin, it will take over our lives once again. And therefore we must nail it to the cross 
immediately. We must start fighting against it immediately as soon as it gets up and, and we see it again. Those who belong to Christ fight against sin daily. But maybe you have given up the fight. Maybe your arms have become weak and your your legs are giving way under you. You say that the battle against sin is too hard, it's it's too painful for you. Well, then I want to encourage you to get up and fight again, to kill it at any cost. Why? Because you have to kill sin or it will kill you. You cannot live as you please and think that there will be no consequences. You cannot flirt with the passions and the desires of the flesh. You have to come and admit your sin before the Lord and you have to repent from it and you must ask forgiveness and He will forgive you but but then you cannot continue to live in sin. You have to do what is necessary because you know the necessary consequences of those who continue a life in sin. Crucify sin and then don't pick it up again. Keep it on the cross until it die. Fight again to, to, until you are victorious. They do whatever it takes until you've killed it. And when you've killed one, then you must fight to do the next, to kill the next. But maybe you are fighting against sin every day, but it doesn't seem like you're winning. It seems like you're always losing it. It's too great. It's too difficult for you. Then I want to say to you, perseverance win. We have a great cloud of witnesses encouraging us along the way. Because eventually the Lord will come and He will completely set us free. But until then, we have to keep fighting against sin. And as we are on this race to the finish line, As we are battling against sin, let us look over our soldier's shoulder for a moment. Let us look over our shoulder for a moment and let us see the corpses of all the sins that we have killed before in our life. Let that be an encouragement to us to keep on fighting and to keep on destroying sin as we go along. You see, the solution is not giving up the moment that it becomes difficult. The solution is to fix your eyes upon Jesus and to fight until you've reached the finish line. But secondly, the second instruction that's given to us in this passage is to walk by the Spirit. So not only should we crucify the flesh, we should also walk by the Spirit. Those who belong to Jesus Christ live according to the Spirit and walks according to the Spirit. That's what verse 25 says to us. I actually like the way the ESV puts it. It says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now it's interesting, both these verbs, to live and to keep in step, both of those Verbs are in the past continuous tense, which means that it's something which started somewhere in the past, but we have to continue in this up until forever. So we live by the Spirit if we belong to Christ, but we have to continue to live in this way. We keep in step with the Spirit if we belong to Christ, but we have to continue in that way. But then there's another interesting thing about these two statements. The first, to live by the Spirit, and the other one, to keep in step with the Spirit. And that is that to live by the Spirit, the first one, is passive, which means that it is something that we are. We are those as Christians who live by the Spirit. The Spirit lives in us, and we live by the Spirit. That's who we are. But then the second one, to keep in step with the Spirit, is in the active, which means that that is not something we are, that is something we need to do. We must follow the leading of the Spirit. That's what it's saying. We have to do what the Spirit tells us to do. And so here's the point. 
live through the Spirit is what the Spirit works in us. The moment that He comes, live, comes and lives in us. He draws us and he, he leads us and He shows us the way in which we should go. He comes and He reveals the truth to us by revealing God's Word to us. But to keep in step with the Spirit is something that we must do as a result of the fact that the Spirit lives in us. And that means that we should daily zeal to die to the flesh and to do what the Spirit calls us to do. For, perhaps to give you an illustration that will help us to understand what I'm trying to say is, let's say that we on a dangerous journey. we on foot uh, climbing some great mountain range or something. And, and the Holy Spirit is the one who is leading us. He's walking in front and, and, and we must walk where he walks he shows us how we should walk and we should follow him he he also he warns us against the dangers he says to us don't walk here don't walk here because those places are dangerous and so we must keep in step with the spirit we should listen to what the spirit says we should walk where he leads us but that's not always easy Sometimes it's difficult because, you see, while we are following the Spirit and, and He's showing us this road, we, we see another road. And that road seems much nicer. It seems much more enjoyable. Actually, it's got a much prettier view. And that's the way of the flesh, and, and, and that's the road we want to walk on. But what we don't see is that that road, the road of the flesh, is a very dangerous road because it leads to a great cliff and you don't see it until you're on top of the cliff so that you will fall over it. It leads to hell, to eternal hell. But if we keep in step with the Spirit, while it might be difficult for us to walk there, we will be safe. That's what it means to keep in step with the Spirit, is to follow the Spirit, even if it goes against your own desires and your own passion. Because your own desires and passions are those of the flesh. But how do we do this practically? I mean, it's easy to say that we should walk according to the Spirit, and that we should not walk according to the flesh. But how do we do this practically? So I want to give a, a few practical advices. How do we keep in step with the Spirit rather than follow the passions and the desires of our flesh? How do we actively fight against the flesh? How do we actively keep in step with the Spirit? Well, firstly, I want us to see what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 and 6. He says, For those who live according to the flesh, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit sets their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So the solution, firstly, is that we should think spiritual things. We shouldn't think fleshly things. And so every time that fleshly things fleshly thoughts comes up in your mind, you should force yourself to think of spiritual things. I, I apply this in my own life, and it works for me, and, and I'm sure others would agree with me that it works, to force my thoughts to doing the things that are spiritual, spiritual things. Force your thoughts by reading your Bible, by Praying, by phoning a Christian friend and just having a chat, by not being idle, sitting around doing nothing, by reading spiritual books and listening to a sermon online. Think spiritual things and this will help you not to live according to the flesh, but to keep in step with the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, don't give the flesh a foothold in your mind because it will take your mind over. Think spiritual. Fight against fleshly thoughts. But not only in our thoughts should we fight against, and we should also do it in the things that we do, because we do, sadly we do things which are not spiritual, but fleshly. And so Paul wants us also to understand that we have to stop doing fleshly things, 
by rather doing spiritual things. Listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5. I'm not going to read the whole chapters, both chapters. You can go and read it yourself, but I want to just mention a few things. The principle is given to us in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22 to 24. This is the principle that he's trying to bring over. He says, put off the old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put in put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness so what the second point is I'm trying to make is the second point is that we should not just be thinking spiritual things rather than fleshly things but we should also be doing spiritual things rather than fleshly things and so he gives a few practical examples of what he's trying to say and i'm just going to mention a few of them verse 25 therefore having put away falsehood let each one speak the truth with his neighbor so we can clearly see the fleshly things is to speak falsehood to lie in other words and the spiritual things that we should rather be doing is to speak the truth with our neighbor not to lie, to speak the truth. Verse 26. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So, do not let your anger consume you. Do not allow your anger to become sin. How should we do that? By being spiritual, by doing spiritual things. By not letting the sun go down on our anger. The third one, 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands. So, instead of stealing the fleshly work, labor hard with your hands, doing honest work. Number 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth but only such which is good for building up, that fits the occasion, that give grace to those who hear. So rather than speaking corrupt things, things which are not building up, things that are evil, things that are not God-honoring, instead of doing those things, the things of the flesh, rather say things that are building up, that fits the occasion, that gives grace to those who listen. And then the final one I'm going to mention, which is only actually a few of them in one, verse uh, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. All malice. So that's the things that we should put away. And instead, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And Paul continues on this list into the next chapter in verse chapter 5 as well. But go and read chapter 4 and verse uh, chapter 5 of, of Ephesians. But I think I've made my point. My point is that the way in which we kill the flesh is to go in the opposite direction. The way in which we kill the flesh is to be led do the, doing the things that the Spirit leads us to do. Those are the things that the people who belong to Christ do. Perhaps the problem that you are experiencing is that you are surrounding yourself with people who live according to the flesh. And when people live according to the flesh, what do they do? They encourage you to live in the flesh like they do because they feel that you are judging them simply by being there. So they want you to fall in the same trap as they are. I want you to say, I want to say to you, get away from such people. Because they are not doing you any good. They are leading you to destruction. But maybe you will say to me, well, I, I can't get rid of these people. Why? Because perhaps you are married to them. Or, or they are your children or your parents. Or you stay in the same house. Or you work together. Or you are forced to meet with them at some times. But then I want to remind you that you don't have to do what they are doing. What you must do as a Christian is that you should do the things that of those who belong to Christ. You should stand up for what is right. You should do spiritual things. And they might get angry with you. Then so be it. Let them get angry. Because 
we have to understand that for us to kill off sin is not going to be easy. It's going to be painful. Crucifixion is painful, but it's necessary. Or maybe you are one who tries very hard to keep in step with the Spirit, but you continue to fail. You find yourself in the flesh all the time. And I want to encourage you to get back up and dust off your feet and go on. And do again the things of the Spirit. You see, brothers and sisters, we have to keep the faith. We have to keep fighting. Because those who are in Christ, this is the encouragement, those who are in Christ will ultimately be victorious against sin. If they persevere to the end, they will eventually come to the place where there will be no more sin, no more pain, no more trouble. But only if we persevere to the end, if we keep fighting. You may say to me, well, how do I know that the Spirit is leading me? How do I know what the Spirit is teaching me? Well, He shows you and teaches you and motivates you. And He does so in one of these ways. The primary way in which He does it is He teaches and leads us and motivates us through the Word of God. That's the primary, actually the only way in which he does it, but he does it sometimes in different ways to get us to understand what the Word of God is teaching us. The first thing that we have to understand is that if we are struggling with a spiritual battle, when we are struggling that we are fallen in the flesh, spend time in God's Word, but also spend time in prayer, asking and pleading with the Holy Spirit to help you. So that's the second way in which we can find the help of the Holy Spirit is through praying. But He's only going to direct you straight back to the Word of God because that's the way in which He teaches us. He also helps us sometimes through other believers who takes us to the Word of God and shows us, hey, look at what you're doing. Look at what God's Word is saying. But perhaps you are saying to me now, well, I'm, I'm struggling with this. I'm, I, I don't read my Bible anymore. I don't even pray. I, I, I don't want to go to church. That's maybe what you're saying to me. Well, perhaps you even doubt today that maybe I'm not a believer. And it's possible that you aren't a believer. But if you're not a believer, that's not something you just you can just leave there. I mean, this is something very serious, isn't it? You are in great danger. You are on your way to hell if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you need to seriously speak to somebody. Speak to me or speak to somebody else. But perhaps I can encourage you through this and say to you that the very fact that you are troubled by your spiritual condition is perhaps an indication that you are a believer. I'm not saying that it's sure, but it's very possible that it is actually an indication that you are a believer. And then I want to encourage you with the encouragement that I've given to somebody very recently. Somebody recently came to me and said to me, I don't go to church, I don't read my Bible, I don't pray, because I'm not motivated to do these things. I struggle with the things in my life, and and really there was sin in his life. And my answer to him is, just do it. Even if you're not motivated, because the motivation will come as soon as you start doing it. You see, because that's exactly what your flesh wants from you. Your passions and your desires does not want you to read the Bible. Doesn't want you to pray. Doesn't want you to go to church. Why? Because it wants to discourage you to do these things because your spirit, your, sorry, your flesh, the desires of your flesh, the, 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 the passions of your flesh desires to kill you. It wants you to do the sin that's going to kill you. So stand against it by opening your Bible, by closing your eyes and praying. By getting in your car and driving to church. Because that's what it means to keep in step with the Spirit. That's what those who belong to Christ does. They crucify the flesh. And they walk in the Spirit. They keep in step with the Spirit. Do that.
Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this time that we have had together. And Oh Father, this is such a difficult battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's a battle within us. It's a battle against our own desires, the desires of our flesh. And Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that warns us and teaches us and leads us and encourage us to do the things that brings glory to God. Help us to listen more carefully to Him and to follow Him, to keep in step with the Spirit rather than to fall and do the works of the flesh. Help us to crucify the works of the flesh so that we will kill them in us, so that they will have no place in our lives anymore. And then whenever we do fall in the sin, Father, help us to get up again and to fight against, against, again against these sins. Help us to love you more than we love our sins. Help us to be those who through their lives show that we belong to Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that helps us. Help us to listen to him. And to follow his lead. We pray in Jesus name. Amen.